Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar about Transcribus. Uh, the, today, we're giving you an update about Transcribus. So there's many news uh, in and around Transcribus, and we are very happy that so many of you joined us today uh, to discover what's new and how we are going to uh, present everything. Uh, we will have a look at that in a second. So here's the agenda of today's webinar. Um, yeah, first, I will give you a short introduction uh, about the webinar and who is going to present it. Then we will have a look at the Transcribus workflow in general, and then the exciting things uh, are uh, going to be on the agenda. So we will talk about the new editor, which is currently in beta stage, but will be released next week, as well as the field and table models with, that will also be released next week. And then also Transcribus sites, which you can al already find on app.transcribus.org. Uh, .eu, sorry. And then also we will have a short uh, look at the new subscription plans and uh, short outlook um, on what's going to come uh, in Transcribus soon. So first, let's have a look uh, who you uh, have um, here today or who we have here today. Uh, so your guides for today's journey are on the one hand Miriam. Um, hi Miriam from the user success team. Then we also have Helene here. Uh, who is mainly working in uh, POMS. And then we also have Sara, who's mainly also working in user success uh, together with Miriam. We also have Matthias from the POMS team. And my name is Flo. I am mainly working on, on product here at Transcribus. So um, Transcribus, building Transcribus is the main thing that I'm doing here. But now let's uh, have a quick look at this webinar's content and what Transcribus is after all. Yeah, Transcribus is your AI-powered alley, as we like to say, and that we have designed to simplify your time-consuming work and uh, also make it fun to work with historical documents. So our vision is to unlock historical documents uh, together with the community. And we are uh, here to build those tools that enable you as the community to unlock those historical sources. And we're very happy that we can rely on a very, uh, yeah, broad base. We have a cooperative behind Transcribus that is called Recoop with more than 180 members worldwide in more than 30 or 35 currently, I think, uh, countries uh, all over the globe, which is really great. You can see uh, many of those institutions that are members, but we also have many private members uh, that yeah, are basically um, supporting and maintaining Transcribus with their share in Transcribus. But also the user community. So we have more than 170,000 users uh, all around the globe that are currently using Transcribus, which is a really great number, uh, considering that we are coming from a research project uh, back uh, in 2013. Transcribus story started, and 60 years after, Transcribus evolved into a real company, a real thing. And yeah, here we are today. We're really happy about the success that Transcribus had and are yeah, yeah, really proud of what Transcribus is able to do as a cooperative and uh, yeah, with a little bit of a different approach to doing things. So we're not a corporate uh, that is basically uh, profit driven. We need to turn a small profit with Transcribus in order to maintain Transcribus and further develop it. Uh, but in the end, basically Transcribus is a, is a community driven project um, yeah, that is really great. And here you can see an image of last year's user or last year's user conference and we will also have a little sneak peek of this year's user conference at the very end of this um, webinar but now let's have a look at what Transcribus is and how we understand Transcribus so we understand Transcribus as an ecosystem to unlock historical sources and as you can see here this is basically the menu bar of Transcribus uh, the web app that you can currently access and we have basically three major parts in Transcribus and they are called Transcribus Desk, Transcribus Models, and Transcribus Sites. Uh, before I forget it, if you have any questions, uh, please use the chat. Uh, enter those questions in the chat. Uh, our, yeah, my colleagues and I, we will do our best to answer those questions right away. And of course, at the end of this webinar, we will also have space to address those questions and discuss them, uh, yeah, in the plenum. Yeah, coming back to the ecosystem. Um, we have those three workspaces, are they called? The Transcribus Desk, Transcribus Models, and Transcribus Sites. 
And this is basically how we have structured Transcribus to help unlocking and then also publishing historical sources online. But let's have a closer look. Um, what is Transcribus Desk? So Transcribus Desk is basically the core of Transcribus and here you can do text recognition, but also manual editing of historical sources, as well as tagging, so enriching with metadata and also searching of historical documents. So this is the core where you can work uh, with your sources. So basically that is the space where the work happens. Um, then we have uh, the models workspace. This is basically the workspace where you can train your own custom AI models. That's one of the biggest advantages of Transcribus that also paved the success of Transcribus and back when it was still a research project. With Transcribus, you can train your own custom AI models. That was at the time back in 2016 when it became available, uh, basically very innovative. Um, yeah, that you were able to train your own custom AI models with just a few clicks of some buttons. Um, and that's now still, of course, one of the major parts of Transcribus that you can train your own models. We have further evolved and now uh, can already offer four different types of models that you can train, as you can see he here uh, on the slides, uh, which is uh, text recognition models, which Transcribus is mostly known for, but also baseline models. Those are AI models that are here uh, to recognize the lines in those images. So uh, yeah, knowing where the text is, on the image in first place is really important. And for that, you can train your own models and also field and table models. Uh, but we will hear more about field and table models uh, later. And then we also have our newest addition to the suite of uh, Transcribus workspaces, which is Transcribus Sites. This is basically a publishing tool. So you can imagine it like a content management system, uh, as you might uh, name them. Uh, with this tool, you can publish your historical sources online and make them searchable. So you can make the full text searchable as you can kind of uncover those texts with Transcribus in first place. And then also making it uh, available with Transcribus uh, is only a few cl clicks away with Transcribus sites. As you can see here, we already have a number of public sites available, which you can check out by going in into Transcribus and checking them out via the public sites section, where you can see other projects which have already published their very own uh, Transcribus sites. And those are very interesting projects. If you want to have a look at them, um, yeah, I would encourage you to uh, browse those sites and, and yeah, explore what others are doing with Transcribus. Now, my, now I'm handing over to my colleague Miriam that will uh, guide us through the basics of Transcribus and also show us the uh, workflow of Transcribus. So over to you, Miriam. Yes, thank you. And hi to everyone also from my side. So before we really um, talk about all the new and exciting things, we of course also want to give you a brief overview of the basics in Transcribus and also the general workflow. So um, we can, let's see if I can actually... <laughs> yes, okay. Um, so the Transcribus workflow um, basically helps you to go from the image you can see here to a machine readable text that you can then uh, access, enhance, download, etc. And the technology that lies behind Transcribus or behind this uh, kind of magic is called handwritten text recognition. And um, this technology can transform the text of the um, of the scanned images into machine encoded text that then is of course also searchable and can be exported into various different formats. Um, now let's take a look at what actually happens when we use this uh, handwritten text recognition, because there is actually um, some stuff going on. So even though we only have to click on one button to recognize the text, there are actually two steps um, performed in the background. So the first step is a layout recognition that recognizes the lines that you can see in this image here and the text regions um, in this green 
um, in the example um, marked in green. And then in, as a second step, the actual text recognition is performed. So the, um, yeah, the machine recognizes um, the text and you get the, the output in your text editor. So this, this means that before actually recognizing any text in the background, um, the technology has to perform a layout recognition as well. But uh, usually you don't have to do anything more than just click on the recognize button. And um, then let's quickly look at another important um, yeah, in topic in Transcribus, the content management system. So basically how your content is stored in Transcribus. Uh, you can, you usually will start with the collections, which are mostly the single projects that you're working on. So you can see that here we have three different collections. Uh, they all have a name and they all have a, an ID number. Um, and then within these collections, um, the single documents are stored. So you can see here in this collection called Beginners Webinars, there are 17 actual documents. And then within these documents, the actual images are stored. So this is the kind of management system that Transcribus uses to store your uh, documents. And now let's quickly take a look at this inside the platform or in the interface. Um, so if we go to the home page uh, of the Transcripts interface, we are now uh, in the home area in the desk section, as Flo has already mentioned before. And we can then see here our recently opened documents and also our recently recently opened collections. Um, and then if we click on the collection that is called English webinar, January 2024, um, we can see, or we should see, yes, exactly, um, the different documents. So here you can see we have a few different documents. They have um, a number of different pages inside. So this one has 26 pages, this one has 40. Here are 732 pages. So you can see that within the documents, you can, you can store a lot of images. And this, if we just quickly look at this as well. So this is how the document um, page look, looks like where you can see all the individual images. Um, and then let's go back to the slide um, to actually check out the basic Transcribus workflow. So, of course, we will start by uploading some documents and then we can recognize this. Um, so we will start in the Transcribus desk area as we have just seen right now. and. So this is the um, yeah an overview of the basic Transcribus workflow because there are two options that you can choose. So of course in the beginning you have to start by uploading your documents or one document, and then you have the question if there might already be a suitable model that you can use to recognize your documents, so a suitable handwritten text recognition model. Then um, if that model is already available, you can just uh, go ahead and start the text recognition. Then you will receive the text output. You can maybe enhance it by using some text or some structural tags. You can of course search this text output and then you can download it. Uh, if there is no suitable model available for your documents, you have to um, yeah, do a bit of extra work. Then you can start a separate layout recognition pro 
process or you can just do the layout recognition or draw up the, the layout manually, so the lines and the text regions. Uh, and then you have to create ground truth pages. So that actually just means the you have to uh, um, recognize the text or you have to correct it or just type it in from scratch so that you get the layout and the correct text side by side. And using this ground truth data, you can then start your own text recognition uh, model training. And once you have that, you can go back to this step, starting the text recognition using this model. And then you receive, again, your recognized text and can further edit it or search it or download it. So this is the basic transcripts workflow. And for this webinar today, we will only look at the one or the steps that are highlighted right now. So we will um, check out how to upload a document. And then we already have a text recognition model available. So we'll then just run the text recognition and I will also show you how to download this. So um, this is what you have to, these are the steps that you have to follow to uh, upload a document. First, it is good to create a new collection or you can use the default collection that is created for you when you um, register for an account. So then you would go to the tab collections from the homepage and then click on new collection. Then you open this uh, newly created collection and you can upload your files. So you can upload images. These have to be in JPEG or PNG format, or you can upload documents. Um, uh, or sorry, you can upload PDF um, files. And then we have already just seen a um, preview of the next slide. So um, just as a general um, rule, of course, um, handwritten text recognition can recognize handwritten documents, but you can also use it or train it to recognize historical prints. So books or newspapers can also be recognized. But um, it's important to note that there is no general model for all scripts or all languages um, and epochs available. So basically you always have two options. Either you can use a public model that has already been trained on similar documents or similar scripts by the Transcribus community. Or if there is nothing um, that suits your script, then you can, as I already mentioned, train a custom model to recognize the specific handwriting or the specific font that um, uh, yeah, that you need for your documents. And for that, you need, yeah, uh, an amount of images and their transcriptions, which is the ground truth data. Um, as I mentioned, there are some public models that have been trained by us or by the whole Transcribus uh, user community. Um, so, at the moment, we have 186 public models available for you to try. Um, here you see a screenshot, an overview, what this looks like. And um, just one thing to point out is that we also have something that is called super models. These are transformer-based models, um, and they are very big and very general models um, that you can use to recognize a variety of different materials, writing styles and languages. And they are quite convenient also for documents that have both handwritten and printed text. Um, so uh, yeah, these are very useful. Um, we have this first uh, supermodel um, we have published it back in April, the text Titan 1, which was trained on English, Dutch, French, Finnish, German, and Swedish. But um, as you can see here, <laughs> um, this is now limited to the Scholar 
subscription plan or higher. So if you are just um, in the individual subscription plan, then you can't use um, the Tax Titan one at the moment. We will talk about this more then at the, at the end of the webinar. Um, so let's take a look at um, the interface. So what this uploading and recognizing actually looks like. So I'm going back now to the collection overview. As I said here, you could create a new collection, just type in the name and click on create. But I will now go to this um, webinar collection that we already have and then upload a new file. Um, so now I need <laughs> I need the image, the prepared image to upload um, that we have here, the example. Not sure if I can, yeah, drag a drop. Thank you. So now we have the example image. Um, we can give it a different title title, example, letter, and then click on submit. Okay, <laughs> um, this should not happen, of course, but that is probably a result of us sharing the, um, <laughs> the presentation and recording. So let's see. Um, something that is also uh, good to mention here is that you can switch between image upload and PDF upload here. So if you wanted to upload a PDF file, you have to switch um, the selection here. But of course, because I'm, I want to upload a JPEG file, um, I have to keep the image selection. Um, let's see why this is not... Yes, okay, somehow I cannot... Um, I cannot upload the file here now, but this is what it looks like. So if I click on submit, um, usually the file should be uploaded. Um, I think this is really um, because we are sharing the the presentation. No, I, and... I think I think it's because of the rights. We haven't ah, credited okay. enough rights to that user, so it's basically a collection of another user. We can try it in a different collection, and there it should work. If we go to the very own collection mm -hmm. here and try it out again, um, yeah, then it yes. works. Okay, so great. basically the user <laughs> probably was only added as a transcriber as there is uh, yeah, user management also included because it was, the user probably didn't have enough rights to upload. Yes. So, yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, great that we figured that one out. Um, so we can actually check now in the jobs table. So when we clicked on submit, there was an upload jo job started and we can see here now that um, this user uploaded or created this document and the state is already finished. So the job is done and then we click here on open. And so we can see we are now in this um, collection. Um, the document is example letter and this is the image that is inside the document. And if I now click into it, um, the, the document editor is open. And we can see here already that we are in the new document editor. Um, so because we are in the beta version right now, and my colleague Helene will tell you more about this in a minute. But um, basically, it it's not very different. <laughs> there is also a recognition button here, or we can just start the automatic transcription from here. And so now we have to select a public model um, from the 168 ones available. The first one default model is always the text Titan one, which you can see here now that I cannot um, really select it. So if I choose another one, I can start the recognition here. For the text Titan, I cannot do so. So it, it's asking me now to upgrade to the Transcribus Scholar plan. Um, but we don't need the text Titan for this specific letter. We can just search for another English 
recognition model. And we can choose, for example, this, the English Eagle, which is a very big in general English um, recognition model for English documents. And so I can then just start the recognition for this page. And now we can see that another job has started. Uh, we can again go back to the jobs overview and we can see that uh, um, maybe open the full jobs table. And now we can see that the job um, is created, but we are in the queue now. So it will take a bit um, to actually have the finished transcription, but that is fine because we have also prepared what this would look like. So we have the example letter here as well. And once the recognition is done, we can then see that it looks like this. So we have the image here and then the recognized text here. Um, and that is basically the workflow from uploading to recognizing a page with a text recognition model. Um, and then let's go quickly back to the slides so that I can show you how to um, export or download the recognized text or the recognized documents. So this basically is also very easy. You just um, select either the entire document or the pages that you want to um, export. And then you click on the three dots next to the recognize and train model buttons. And then you select export for that. And um, at the moment, there are um, there is a standard export available with, with which you can download the images um, per se. You can also download the uh, recognized text as PDF, as um, a Word document, or as a text file. Um, and if we then just quickly go back to the interface again, we'll just have a look how this looks like in Transcribus itself or in the interface. If we can just switch again. So we have this uh, recognized page here. I then just select, we only have this one here and click on the three dots and export. And here you can then see we have the standard export and um, within the other subscription plans, we also have different export options available, but within the standard export, we can, for example, just download this as a PDF file and start the export. And then again, we get this message just that the job was started and we will get a download link via mail or when the job is done, you can also um, click on the three buttons here and download, download the PDF just directly from here. Um, so, and yeah, this was the basic Transcribus workflow from uploading to recognizing to downloading. And now my colleague Helene is taking over with, um, to show you what you can do if the standard recognition maybe didn't work as well as expected. Thank you so much, Miriam. I think that we can switch directly back into the interface to work with the editor. Um, Miriam showed us already before a little sneak peek of the editor. And some of you might have realized that we have made some changes and uh, some improvements. So just to review, the editor is here to transcribe and edit the text, the text or modified the layout structure. So on the left side, we can see the layout editor and on the right side, the text editor. We have put the tools bar um, or the menu bar on the sides. If you remember in the old or current editor, the menu bars are even in the image. So now we try to clean it up a little bit and put them on the side. You can again choose to grab and use the drag mode or go to the selection mode. Here you can also add lines or add regions. So what are lines and regions? The text region is the field. Zoom out a little bit. 
that encloses all the handwritten text. So that is the text region. The baselines are the reference points for text recognition. This is a polyline that runs along the bottom of the handwritten line of text right here. Now, what you can do in the layout editor is you can also edit, for example, the text region. If you click on the text region and press Shift on your keyboard, you can also edit it if you only want to have this as a text region or maybe a bigger one. You can edit that. If you want to split the region uh, horizontally, press H on your keyboard and you will see that a horizontal line will appear where you can split it, for example, in half. If you want to use a vertical split, then just press the V on your keyboard. In this case, it doesn't really make sense with the letter to split it vertically, but just to show you what you can do. In the layout editor, you can also add structural tags. Click on the right of your mouse, and then you can choose a structure type. So for example, paragraph, heading, initial, Let's go for example for paragraph right here. Uh, one thing that is also quite interesting if you work with the layout are some keyboard shortcuts, such as I mentioned before, um, pressing H or V or Shift to change something. Click on the three dots on the right side, and then you have a list of some keyboard shortcuts that can help you out when you want to edit. We also have a list of those on the Help Center. So if there are any unanswered questions for now, you can always go to the Help Center and look for answers there. Then let's look at the text editor. Let's maybe increase the font size a little bit. In the text editor, you can edit, as the name says, you can edit the text. For example, if you used a public model and the text recognition was not perfect because the public model was not trained on the specific type of handwriting that you uploaded, there can be some mistakes. So this is a perfect way where you can edit, I don't know, let's just say you can delete, for example. Here you can see that you can also, oops, another little hiccup. Um, you can also um, basically underline words here you can also add tags. You can add textual tags. For example, the name of a person. Let's see if it works now or if it's also, I think it's a little bit shy. It's a demonstration effect. Um, but here you can also add uh, textual tags. What you can also do here is edit the layout. Ah, now it works, perfect. So you can choose uh, abbreviation date person. You can also add more tags uh, if you want uh, and add the tags under tag settings. Here you can also see you can change the text to bold or cursive. So you have some options there when you want to work with the text. Exactly, we can see here is the date tag. Thank you so much. Uh, another thing you can change just, here just is... Just one very quickly. Uh, it didn't work because now you can enable or disable the tagging feature, which you couldn't before. So that's ah. one of the new things, and that's why it didn't work. But I, I needed right. to fight for the mouse. Until <laughs> I'm I sorry. Was <laughs> Struggles of sharing the screen. Thank you so much, Flo, for clarifying that. Uh, here you can also edit the layout tree. So again, if, for example, you want to switch around um, the lines, you can just click on the layout tree here, open the region, and then just for demonstration's sake, let's move this line and you can immediately see how the line switches. So this way you can again correct or edit your transcriptions. One other really important thing or a nice tool that we have is the setting or the settings button. Here you can really play around and configure your editor. For example, you can choose to show or not show the, uh, the numbers of the text editor. Let's see if it works. Um, you can also choose, for example, in the image to show the regions. 
the baselines. So now they're gone. You can see here that the blue line appears. You can also choose to not show the polygons. You can also change, for example, the label size. So now you saw that the numbers increase drastically. If, for example, you want to have a more prominent uh, numbering. What you also can change is the line color, for example. So if it's a bit hard to see the contrast with the background, you can just click here on line color and switch it, for example, to this bright pink. So you have more of a contrast. In this way, you can really play around and optimize the layout editor so that you can best work with it. When you're done with editing and you're satisfied with the transcription, you can save your document or your page. If you still want to keep working with it, then you can also simply change the status. So right now it's a uh, ground truth, but you can also change it to in progress if you're still working on it or undone if the transcription is done, but you still want to check it. If you want to go back, because for example, you're not satisfied with the transcription, you can also click on version history and go back to a different version. We've also seen before that here by clicking on the three dots, you can see the keyboard shortcuts. So this is also, for example, where you can directly export your uh, pages. You can also share or, for example, click to help if uh, click on help if you have any questions. So now we've uh, reviewed the basics. We've also seen the new layout of the new editor. And now we will move on to the new features and my colleague Sarah will introduce the field and table models. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elena. Now let's go on to the next slide. Yeah. Now we will talk about uh, field and uh, table models. Next slide, OK. Um, field models uh, are only available for in uh, beta for now. So if you want to access them uh, or test them, uh, go to beta.transcribus.au and you can use the same credential that you use on the normal web app uh, to access beta. And uh, the field models need to extract uh, information from uh, a page, uh, information that, are, um, that have a, a layout uh, uh, meaning. So in this case, uh, we have this uh, um, register card uh, and uh, we don't want to uh, transcribe the entire content uh, of the document because we are not interested in it, uh, but we want just to extract uh, the name, the, the birthplace uh, and uh, the birth year. Um, for doing this, uh, we need uh, to train uh, a field model. Uh, we can teach uh, the machine uh, to automatically detect uh, the text regions uh, that we are interested in, uh, and then uh, we will uh, recognize uh, them. So instead of uh, uh, transcribe uh, all the printed and unwritten uh, uh, words on this document, uh, we can uh, teach the machine uh, to look only at the information that we want to extract. Uh, for this type of documents, we need to use uh, uh, fields models. Uh, fields models can be trained to automatically recognize and mark certain layouts components uh, of the documents. So it doesn't work only for on forms. Um, we have first uh, to uh, draw the text regions uh, that we are interested in. Uh, and these uh, text regions are called uh, field. And we can also decide uh, if you want to assign uh, structural tags uh, to those text regions. Uh, in this case, uh, in the image you see, we have the structural tag name, uh, ORT, and uh, uh, year. Um, and we can also teach the machine to automatically assign uh, those structural tags. Uh, why they are important, uh, it really depends on the project. Uh, but if you want them to export uh, all this information into an Excel, uh, in a spreadsheet, uh, you will end up uh, with uh, um, a column name, uh, named name, a column named ORT, uh, and another column there named uh, year. 
and you will have uh, all the information for all these forms uh, in a structured way. And you can then work uh, on the data, make your searches or mm, what you need to do. Um, some application of the fields models are uh, uh, when you are working with uh, complex text regions. Uh, so in transcribes, uh, as uh, uh, Miriam has shown us, uh, uh, you can uh, uh, automatically recognize the layout uh, when uh, you start uh, a text recognition. But there are sometimes uh, some uh, um, complex uh, layouts uh, printed out and written, and uh, you want to recognize certain uh, regions uh, as a separate ones, so like in this, in this case, the signature here at the, at the bottom, you can train a, a field model to do that for you. Um, another example, it's a bit slow, yeah, is newspaper. Here you can uh, segment uh, the uh, a newspaper page and uh, divide uh, it uh, in headers uh, and uh, paragraphs or articles. Uh, so each uh, article uh, will have its uh, own uh, text region uh, and you can also tag them uh, as paragraph or header. And so you can then decide uh, to work uh, separately on, uh, on them. Another um, use of fields models is for form segmentation. Also the first example that I show you. So here, instead of transcribing the entire form, you can just uh, select uh, uh, the information that you are interested, tag them, uh, and then export uh, the information. And also with printed layouts, uh, uh, it's very useful uh, if you have complex layout, uh, like in this case, two columns uh, with header at the top, uh, you can easily train uh, field models to recognize the specific layout of your documents. So, um, to do that, uh, um, you need uh, about uh, 50 pages uh, of training data or 50 pages of uh, ground truth. Um, it's important to note that fields models uh, are not the general models, so you need to train a, a field model for your very specific use case uh, for your collection, for your documents. Uh, it's very difficult to apply uh, other fields models to your documents, uh, unless we are talking about newspapers that have uh, quite a, a um, um, traditional uh, structure or recurrent structure. The first thing to do is uh, to draw a text region around uh, the relevant information that you want to extract, uh, as uh, Lene has shown us before. And then uh, you can uh, assign a structural tag. Uh, the structural tag is uh, optional, so you don't need uh, to assign them if you're not interested in that. Um, and here we have an example. So we have uh, um, those uh, text regions uh, and uh, we have customized I have customized the uh, structural tags uh, and call them shelf mark, uh, name, uh, newspaper details. Uh, and because I'm, I'm not interested in this part of the tag, in this part, uh, or in, sorry, um, let's go back. In this um, stamp here, uh, you can, I just uh, um, omit them uh, from my training data and uh, the model will learn uh, to do the same. Uh, um, yeah, when you have done this uh, uh, on about uh, 50 pages, uh, you can uh, train uh, your uh, uh, field model and creating the ground truth uh, is, uh, is quite fast. Uh, despite uh, creating the ground truth for the text recognition, because you need to type uh, all the transcriptions uh, for fields model, it's quite uh, easy to do it. And uh, when you have your 50 pages, uh, you go to the model tab, the ones that uh, um, Flo show, showed us at the beginning. And here you need to select uh, the option, uh, train a new model uh, and uh, the, the type of model that you want to train is a field model. At this point, uh, you are asked uh, to select uh, the training data and uh, the validation data. This is common uh, in uh, uh, when we talk about the machine learning. So, and it also happens with uh, all the other models. Uh, when you have your ground root, uh, your 50 pages uh, of uh, ground root, uh, you need to assign uh, around 90% of them uh, to the training data and 10% uh, of them uh, to the validation data. The training data is the actual pages uh, on which the model learn. 
the validation data is a, a set of pages uh, uh, put aside during the training uh, and used by the model to um, refine the parameters and attest uh, its accuracy. So the validation data is set aside uh, and it serves the model to see how it is performing and how well it is learning. Uh, so the first step uh, is to select the training data. So the, your grant root pages, uh, you can choose the collection, the documents and the pages. Then in this case, uh, you have to select uh, uh, the tags uh, that you want to train. Uh, in this section uh, here, text selection, you can decide if you want to train uh, just the text regions uh, without uh, tags, uh, and this is an option. Or if you want to train uh, uh, specific tags uh, like paragraph, uh, image, uh, header, and uh, so on. Uh, then you can you have to select the validation data and uh, there is the option to automatically assign 10% uh, of your grant root uh, to the validation data. And we always recommend uh, to do it, uh, but there is also the possibility to assign it uh, manually. Then there is model setup uh, when you need to add the metadata of the model, like the, the, the title, uh, the description, uh, uh, and other details. Uh, and uh, there you can also change the button settings, uh, like the training cycles and the learning rate. But for the first uh, um, training, so we really recommend you to stick uh, with uh, the suggested uh, values. And at the end, uh, you can start your training. Uh, going to the job tab, uh, you will see the status of your training. Uh, and after a couple of hours or one day, it really depends on the size of your training data, you will, your model will be ready and you can do the recognition uh, of new pages with that. Uh, Right. Now we will see how tables models works. They are similar to fields models and tables models automatically recognize the rows and the columns and does improve the extraction and analysis of tabular data because then you can export uh, them uh, in, uh, you can export uh, the, te the um, text uh, in a structured way. Uh, export them uh, it uh, in a spreadsheet uh, and work uh, on uh, on it. Um, differently from uh, fields models, in this case, the model learns to recognize uh, uh, rows, columns, uh, or both. Uh, so you can also work uh, with table. You can also create tables if you have just rows or columns, uh, or when you have a traditional table with both rows and columns. Uh, as in the case of fields. Uh, this is not a general model, so you won't find a public model that works for every type of existing table, but you need to train a table model for a specific type of table inside your collection or document. Um, you can also train a table model if there are uh, even if there aren't visible separators for columns and rows. We know that. Um, there is a great variety of uh, historical tables. So you can uh, uh, also train models uh, when there are no printed uh, or draw separators, uh, draw columns, but just a white space uh, to indicate them. And uh, with enough training data, a model can handle multiple types of tables, but you need to include uh, all the tables that you want to train the model on in your training material. Uh, here, in a is an example of table. Here we don't have ver uh, vertical and uh, um, horizontal separator, but just the white space uh, between uh, uh, the columns and the rows. And this is the recognition of the rows, uh, and uh, this is the recognition of the um, columns. Uh, and what you see in the end in Transcribus is the intersection of uh, uh, both uh, columns and rows. Another example is this one. So this is the result. And as you can see here, um, there is no, um, there is the, here, we created a column and train it, but in reality, in the original document, there was no column here. So the model can also learn to add other columns or to um, omit uh, columns if you're not interested in the first uh, or in the last one. Uh, this is an example of how the model performs with the skew tables. Uh, 
and uh, the last one uh, uh, is uh, um, how it works with the multi-line cells. So, so even if the um, the rows, uh, the height of the rows varies, uh, you see the model with enough training material is capable to recognize that the, that the, this row is just three um, three rows and uh, this is much larger. Um, to prepare the training data, uh, if we are talking about uh, easy tables, uh, you just need uh, 20 pages uh, manually um, annotated uh, to train your model. In the case of different difficult tables, uh, you need uh, at least 50 pages. Uh, and if you have a mix, if you want to train uh, a model on different type of tables, uh, uh, you need between 50 and 100 pages of ground truth, depending on the number of tables and their complexity. And now I will just show you how to um, create uh, the ground truth, so how to annotate uh, a table uh, and create the ground truth. So let's go back to the uh, platform. Let's take uh, this one. Okay. The first thing to do is uh, to uh, draw the table. So you select uh, this button and then you click uh, to start the table. And uh, you click again to end it. And now we have drawn our table. Um, it's up to you if you want to include this part uh, or not. Uh, usually we don't include it uh, because we can just add uh, those uh, um, info that are always the same on each page uh, during post-processing. So when you have your Excel sheet, uh, you can just add uh, the title of each column. And then as Helena has shown us, uh, we can uh, uh, click uh, B on the keyboard uh, to create uh, the the columns uh, and uh, click H uh, to create uh, the the rows uh, and this uh, is enough. Uh, so when you have uh, done, uh, you have segmented the entire table. You can save it uh, as a ground truth, and uh, this uh, is enough to train uh, uh, our. Uh, model, uh, our table model. Uh, you don't need uh, to add uh, the lines uh, or to add uh, the transcription because uh, the training also uh, only happens on the image uh, and on this uh, structure here, so in the table. We can go back. Uh, can we go back to the presentation? And the last step uh, is how to train uh, the field model. Thank you. Uh, it's similar to the uh, field model. So also here, you need to select the training data. We don't have structural tags here. So you jump right away to the validation data, the model setup, uh, and uh, the advanced settings. But also here, we don't recommend to um, modify them uh, at the beginning. Um, here is a summary about uh, fields and tables models. Uh, so you can start uh, with uh, about 40, 60 pages of ground truth, depending on your material. Uh, you have first to prepare the training data with uh, the editor. In the case of fields models, you need to draw and tag the regions. In the case of uh, fields of tables model, you need to draw the tables uh, and uh, uh, draw the columns uh, and the rows. Um, there is no need uh, to add uh, the transcription. Then uh, you can uh, at the hand, you can train your model. And uh, to recognize uh, your pages uh, with tables and fields, uh, you need it's a bit more complex uh, than uh, uh, the other documents we have seen, because there are three steps here. You need first uh, to apply the field or table model to recognize uh, the region, the regions or the tables. After that, uh, you need uh, to uh, run uh, the baseline recognition and only after that, uh, when you have detected text regions uh, and uh, the, the lines, uh, you can start a text recognition. So it's three separate steps uh, 
uh, that you need to do in order to get the text uh, in the end. And after that, you can work on them within Transcribus or export your data in the format that you prefer. And uh, now I will hand over the floor to Matt. Uh, he will talk about Transcribus sites. Yeah, thank you very much, Sarah, and hi to everyone. Also from my side, um, yeah, it's showtime. Uh, we now talk about uh, transcribal sites because um, what you've heard so far is quite a lot of work, quite a lot of work that you have to go through uh, beforehand to, yeah, work on your documents, recognize those, and then also, um, yeah, enriching them putting in tab tables, et cetera, PP. But the nice thing about uh, Transcribus is also that you're uh, able to publish later on. So uh, with Transcribus sites, uh, which I'm now talking about, this is exactly what's possible. So Transcribus sites is where the show happens. All the work that you've put in, you can now publish and you can show to other people outside of Transcribus with your own Transcribus sites instance. So as you can see here, uh, you'll find uh, Transcribal sites directly uh, next to the desk and to the models part. Uh, so the navigation uh, should be quite clear as we've uh, heard about the desk and the models part before. So simply click on this button called sites and then you are basically in the right region. And what we basically can do with Transcribal sites is show our documents in the way that are uh, displayed right here. So it is basically a very easy way to share your material. Uh, you have this nice side-by-side -side view. So on the left side, the original document. Uh, and on the right side, you have the transcript that you have uh, yeah, done before with automatic text recognition. But also, if you produce some manual transcripts, you can also show them through transcriber sites. And you have enhanced searching capabilities. So. This is basically one of the main reasons why we actually do this text recognition um, to make everything searchable. The thing is, when you have transcriber sites, for example, you can simply type in a search term and you'll find it in your documents, so mainly in the transcript, but you always have the connection to uh, the original also on the left. So always the line that is highlighted uh, in the transcript is also highlighted in the original and vice versa. And this way, of course, we make everything way more accessible than it would be if these documents just were in an archive, for example, or somewhere else where you have to go physically in order to look up what you want to know. So these are basically the features that you have in Transcriber Sites. Um, and the question, of course, is how do I get there? How do I basically get my own Transcriber Sites instance? Uh, and this is what we tried to make as easy as possible within uh, the last months. So on the left side, what you can see is part of the uh, content management system um, that is available with Transcriber Sites. When clicking on this button, Sites, then you basically end up here. Uh, and there you can yeah, edit your whole Transcriber Sites instance. Uh, you can give it a title. You can give it a background image. Um, you can control all the texts that are there also on the homepage, but also on the About side, so that you also can talk a little bit about your project. And what you can also include is, is tags, uh, et cetera. Right, so what do you have to do in order to get to your first Transcriber Sites website? As said, first of all, click on the Sites button in the top navigation bar, and then you will find, oh, here we are. Thank you very much for changing. Um, so first of all, what you do is uh, click on this button up here. So the Sites button in the top navigation bar, as I just said, and then you will land right here. What we can he see here is a Sites overview. So we have already got one, uh, which we can show you later about Marjorie Fleming's diary. Uh, but of course, what you can also do is create your own uh, new site by clicking on this button here in the top right corner. Then what you have to do is first of all, give it a title. So for example, diary, um, then you can select a custom URL. Um, so just to, to give it a little bit more flair and to uh, make it shareable also on your side, you can have this unique URL. So for example, diary of, oh God, of a kid, we could just um, yeah write it like this. And then what you have to do is simply see which collection you want to publish. So 
We've heard from uh, Miriam in the first place that um, we have collections in Transcribus and these collections are basically also used for publishing. So you can do the work in one collection, but you can have another collection in which you basically copy your documents or link your documents, uh, which you want to publish. So this way you are of course able um, to navigate uh, through the documents that uh, you're still working on and don't publish them, uh, but have the documents that you want to publish in a separate collection. And then you simply have to click on the collection that you want to share, and then you click on creates sites dot uh, down here. So of course we already have something to show you. So this is why I'm gonna uh, click right into um, the Marjorie Fleming's diary uh, example, which we have here. And now we're already directly in the CMS. This is also where you would end up if you clicked on create sites. And um, now you already see that on the right side, you basically have um, the final product. You have the final uh, Transcriber Sites website there. And on the left, you have the editing uh, possibilities. So I can simply click uh, into the title, for example, and I can delete um, or add something else. So for example, um, an exhibition. Um, so I have already changed the title uh, on the right as well. Um, so you always see live what changes you basically make to transcriber sites. Also, you can change uh, the description by simply clicking here. You can also change how it is uh, formatted. So if you don't want it to be bold, you can remove this right here and rather put in some italics. Um, and you can upload an image right here, which we've already done in the background. Uh, and this is basically where it's being added right here in the, um, in the home page. Then um, you can navigate through your Transcriber Sites instance uh, through two different ways, basically. You have the possibility to change here. So uh, if you want to go to the About section, you can simply use this dropdown. But the more easy way, I think, is to simply use uh, this navigation bar up here. So you can simply click on Home, you can click on uh, Explore, you can click on Search, and also on About. And these are basically also the pages um, that you will be working on. Right, so um, we've done the home page um, and we now want to change um, the view on the right side to the about section because this is the next thing that we want to work on. So simply either use the drop down or use the top navigation there, uh, go to about, and then we have a different sort of uh, CMS uh, editing part on the left side. And also of course, in a, a different page on the right side. And what is possible here always is of course, to again, put in a, uh, a title. Then you can upload images. And um, this image up here is basically the background, which is um, behind about this project in that, um, in that instance. Um, but of course, you can also work on all these uh, several um, yeah, parts of the text that you basically he have here. So what you can do is you can basically simply click on edit and then you can change the text right here. So again, what we will do to showcase it is just uh, adding some uh, yeah, some bold script, for example. And then of course you see that also here, the script is being changed. Yeah, and this way you can uh, then put in some uh, text. As you can see here, we just have text. Uh, in the second part, we uh, don't just have text. We also have an image which is uploaded right here. So simply by a click of this button uh, and the lowest part basically is then text again. You can always add sections if you want, but you can also delete those um, by clicking on this button right here. Uh, and this way you can put it uh, together your very customized about section. Then um, we can have a look at the explore page right here. Uh, and what we see here on the left side is that we have enabled the tags. This is simply done by clicking on this uh, toggle right here. Uh, if you have tags um, as shown before in your documents, then you can enable them. You don't have to. And then of course you can also search which tags you want to add uh, and then basically simply click uh, on the tag and then it is added to your tag directory. And they can basically then be found right here. Um, so 
first of all, you have the documents which are shown, but also the tags. And it is simply this little button that you have to click on in order to toggle between the two. Um, and then if you click on a certain tag, you find um, all these tags showcased right here in, yeah, basically a, um, yeah, a list of results. Then, um, of course, the Explore page gives you some more possibilities in terms of the documents themselves. So here is basically a list of all the documents that you have in your collection. And if you click on one of those, um, you see that here basically you get all the pages that are inside of this, doc uh, of this document. And um, again, there are some things that you can adjust on the left. So for example, the title. And you can also click on one of these pages to just see how basically uh, the yeah the 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 part where you can really read the documents looks like. Um, and as you can see here, we always have this highlighting. If I click into the original at each and every single line, I always get the highlighting also in the transcript on the right and vice versa. And this is basically a very handy way um, to go through the documents and read what is written there. Then we basically just have one page left and uh, let's uh, just put in a search term to see how everything works. And uh, if I now um, put in Fleming, then I get a list of results. Um, and this uh, list of results basically shows us um, the transcript at the top and then always a snippet from the original to always have yeah, the possibility to directly check if the transcript is good enough. Um, I can also have some filters here on the left. Of course, there are not that many in this case as there is uh, just one document. Uh, so if I basically click on this, um, I get the same results in this case, but normally you would have more documents so you can filter by the document here on the left. And then there's also some advanced filters which you can use. For example, you can adjust the fuzzy search. The fuzzy search basically does nothing else than giving you some uh, freedom in terms of what is different uh, between the search term that you put in and what is found in the transcript. So this could be one character, two character, uh, characters or three, depending on how high the fuzziness is basically uh, set. Right, and then you can also filter by the author, for example. Of course, here again, we just have one, but if you had more uh, authors in your, um, in your documents and you would enable this filter, then these are available as well. Right, um, this is basically all about it. When we don't have the possibility to look into the settings right here. I think it is again uh, due to the, um, yeah, to the rights that we have in this role. Um, but this is basically how you set up your own Transcriber Sites website. And if you're then happy with all the editing that you've done, uh, you have a nice home page, you have a nice explore page, you have a nice search page, and also a nice about uh, search, um, site, then you can simply click on want to publish uh, and then give it a go, uh, make it available to the public and let people have a look at what work you have done. So uh, that's it from my side. And now back to you, Florian, and let's talk about some more things, the subscriptions, et cetera. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, very great tool, Transcriber Site. So here, everybody can really showcase uh, what they're up to in Transcribos and in general with their work. Um, but now let's have a look at uh, another uh, new and exciting addition to the Transcribos platform, at least for a uh, yeah, from a perspective of develop, developing Transcribus Salva. So as you've heard at the beginning, uh, Transcribus uh, basically has its roots in a research project or basically two research projects that were led by many uh, leading in universities of uh, in within Europe, which transitioned into co uh, cooperative uh, four years back. And now basically we're kind of taking the next steps in the journey of Transcribus and are introducing or have introduced uh, exactly 13 days ago, the new Transcribus subscription plans. You might have seen some hints already in the software itself, um, which I will also have a look later uh, with you. Uh, but now I'm quickly um, just explaining why we did this uh, and why we are introducing those subscription uh, plans. Uh, yeah, first and foremost, we are very, as you've heard uh, before, a community-driven and try to cater 
a lot of different uh, yeah use cases and a lot of different users. So uh, everybody uses Torscribus a little bit differently, and for that we tried to uh, yeah cater towards this very broad base of users. Um, for this and also to kind of maintain Torscribus further, as you've heard before, we are a cooperative and basically need to uh, yeah make money in order to sustain Torscribus. That's basically uh, what our uh, main purpose is of the cooperative. Um, yeah, as we have in our institute, for instance, um, there is no shareholder or dividend payout. Basically, that's forbidden. We're not uh, paying out any money. So every euro or dollar that is made on Transcribus is reinvested in the platform. And I think that's also one of the main reasons why Transcribus is, uh, yeah, hopefully, as you might have seen, uh, becoming uh, better and greater over time. Um, to make it a little bit more sustainable, we've uh, now transitioned to this model of subscriptions, but uh, we still try to make Transcribus as user-friendly and as kind of open as possible. And that's why we also made a very substantial shift in terms of how much everybody can use for free. So before every user that signed up for, for a free Transcribus account uh, received 500 credits, a one-time package, and then you needed to get your own credits after that. Now we try to uh, yeah, compensate those users that are loyal. So if you stick with Transcribus on a longer uh, term, for instance, uh, already after five or six months, uh, you have more credits than before. So you will get 100 free credits every single month now. Um, they are expiring. So those credits are valid for a month. They do not accumulate. Um, but if you're using Transcribus on a constant basis, then credits, uh, yeah, a lot more than before. So you can use about 1,200 credits a year now. And yeah, in the long run, it's even more. So uh, with the individual plan that we are introducing, we try to be as far as possible. While on the other hand, and let's come to the next slide, we're introducing also some, some more plans. Uh, the main plan is called the Scholar Plan. And that is basically the plan where you get advanced features. So while on the individual plan, uh, most of the features that you've seen will be available. So the entire editor, text recognition uh, will be available. Also training your own custom AI models will be available on the individual plan. Um, but some advanced tools, as you might have seen with the field models and the table models, and those are also the new tools that we're adding to the suite of transcribus and um, they will be only available in the scholar plan so the reasoning was we don't want to take away anything from anybody that uh, has known transcribus before so we tried to put everything that was available before in transcribus into the individual plan and really limit only new additions such as field models table models the super models that we have introduced at least in beta stage over the last couple of months uh, into the scholar plan and obviously also organizational plans they come with uh, advanced capabilities such as user management, because we also are aware that many organizations are also using Transcribus. And for that sake, you need to have a certain user management in order to add your colleagues to Transcribus and also manage the availability of features in Transcribus, as well as having a dedicated success team is very important to us. So we really are interested in having a yeah, partnership to, together with everybody that is using Transcribus and that's why we try to uh, yeah, provide as good as a, of a success management team to uh, the organizational plan users as possible, as well as the API, so the processing API, um, which is the uh, interface that is available on the organizational plans to process large amounts of, of uh, pages through Transcribus. Um, this is mainly used to build Transcribus into other apps. So there is already a number of apps and software out there that are uh, using the Transcribus API to uh, basically enable text recognition within their software. Let's have a closer look what the difference is, as said before, where our reasoning was to kind of not take any, uh, anything away from users that uh, have yeah, known and loved Transcribus before, but only for new features as we're introducing with Transcribus sites, for instance, with field and table models. Um, on the Transcribus color plan. And with the organizational plan, as said, uh, there's more uh, credits are shareable. So in order to distribute credits that you might buy on an organizational scale, um, credits are shareable. So you can transfer credits within Transcribus to other users or collections. 
Then there's also some limitations in terms of user seats. As I said, with the individual and scholar plan, you have basically your own plan. But on the organizational plan, there are different tiers. So 10, 30, uh, 10 or 30 users, but also a custom level. So uh, we really try to tailor uh, the offering to every institution, depending on their use case. And for that, we basically also offer custom user seat amounts. Um, then the export, export formats will be a little bit limited. So that's one of the little uh, things that will be a little bit limited more. Um, the issue here was that there are so many export formats at the moment that this led to a lot of support uh, that we needed to provide. We tried to provide uh, free support to everybody. So at the info at the address uh, that you can reach, we really try to re reply to every single email. Um, but as the, the usage of transcribus grows, we simply cannot cope anymore with that. And for that, we need to uh, restrict some features at least that are leading to a lot of support effort. And for that, um, the export formats will be a little bit more limited on the individual plan, while in this call plan, you can really enjoy anything. Another uh, item on that list is document storage. So currently document storage is not yet limited within Transcribus. We will introduce some limitations, but really try to have a yeah, reasonable amount of storage here. And you can always extend that storage then once we introduce the storage limitation as well as the training runs. So currently on the free individual plan, you can train free uh, for free five models every single month, while on the scholar plan is uh, 30 models. And if you really train 30 models a month, then you're an uh, excellent user of Transcribus. So basically, uh, uh, we think uh, at least data has shown that uh, basically no one is really training 30 models a month. There are some iterations that you might do when training a model. So you train your first model and you make another iteration but with a model a day, you should really have a good amount of run. And yeah, one important thing is here also a little bit uh, to have some consciousness. Uh, training models is a really resource intensive uh, task. So model trainings can run up to two or three weeks. And this obviously is a lot of compute power that uses a lot of energy. And we really try to make uh, that a little bit more obvious that consuming that much energy for training a model and very often for only testing out some things uh, yeah, could be considered a little bit more and to, yeah, to reduce energy usage a little bit at least. Um, yeah, then customer support will be also tiered uh, to, into basic priority and a set a dedicated success team. Uh, while basic, I would still call it priority. So uh, we try to maintain the current level. So the current level that everybody's receiving a reply at our support team uh, will remain the basic one. Uh, we, of course, might take some, some time uh, to reply. That takes a little bit longer, which will be reduced on the scholar plan, of course. So if you're on a scholar plan, then the reply uh, might be a little bit faster as we try to uh, really uh, offer a service for what uh, you're offering in a change. And also the processing speed will be different. So if you're on a scholar plan or organizational plan, you can jump people in front of you. So if you're in a free plan, you will need to be in the queue and need to wait until it's your turn. With the uh, advanced processing speed, you can basically jump, jump everyone in front of you in the processing queue. Once there's a lot of traffic on the servers, which happens to be the case, and we really try to have a powerful infrastructure, but uh, with the sheer massive usage of transcribus, there are some queues that um, sometimes pile up. And for that, you have advanced speeds, so your pages are processed faster. Then as you've heard, um, advanced AI tools under which uh, field models, table models, and also super models fall, and also smart search, which, which we have not spoken about today. Uh, we, this is a rather small tool uh, where you can enhance the search results. So more search hits are found once you type in something in the search bar. Uh, this is also only included in the scholar organizational plans. Yeah, and finally, let's have a look at what that looks like. And yeah, the best part of it is starting a free trial. And also uh, that's something that we will have a look now. As you see here with that golden banner, and you might have seen that already, um, there's a hint that we are upgrading Transcribus to the new subscription model and that your uh, features might be limited. So features that are not available on your plan will also appear as such. For instance, if you try to recognize something 
uh, with the text titan, this will not be available. So basically, you need to upgrade. But the cool thing now is that we really try to uh, also make the usage of those features available to everybody, at least to try it out. So you can start your own free trial. Once you click on start trial, uh, you can start it. And once you are in the free trial, um, yeah, now as you see up here, the free trial has been started. Um, yeah, you see now there's 30 days left in the current trial phase. Uh, and once we go to our usage dashboard, which is also new to Transcribus up here, you can see that I am on a free trial for another 30 days uh, where you can basically experience the scholar plan and all features of it. Below here, you can see the 100 free credits that you receive every single month. Um, yeah, this will be, this uh, 100 free credits will be added. Uh, in this case, for instance, always on the 23rd of the month. So you can use this allowance to enjoy transcribos and yeah, recognize your valuable sources. Let's now quickly jump back to the presentation. Um, yeah, I said, you will see uh, these kind of pop-ups in the software if you are not on a scholar plan, um, but then you can basically really start your free trial and experience those features for 30 days. One other thing, as I've mentioned before, we are coming from academia and we are definitely not forgetting our roots. Uh, we try to support as many users as possible. And for that, we have established a scholarship plan already. Now it's already three and a half years ago where we try to support students that are working with Transcribus. Obviously, many students will not have the budget to have a subscription or uh, yeah, buy credits for their work. And for that, we have uh, launched a scholarship program as well as for teachers that are working together with students in their classes. Um, they're basically students and teachers can apply for a free subscription or for a free credit package that they can use for their work. There are so many exciting projects and I don't have the exact numbers in mind, but I think it's more than 300 scholarships that we've granted now in three, uh, three and a half years uh, to users from, I think, more than 50 or 60 countries. So I'm not 100% sure. I would need to put the data on the slides next time. Um, but on top of my mind, I can just say that we have like more than 300 uh, scholarship beneficiaries. And yeah, I think I don't even know how many credits we granted, but we really try to support as much as possible so for students, this might be a good opportunity. Uh, basically, all we ask is a little bit of an abstract on what they are working. So we're interested basically in what everybody's up to. And we really have like uh, from law to economic history to classical uh, studies that you might expect that work with Transcribus to also very exotic studies uh, that we would not have uh, expected. Uh, yeah, there's a very, very, very huge variety of, of different disciplines and fields where Transcribus is applied and used. And yeah, that scholarship program is yeah, a little uh, step that we are taking to uh, trying to give back to the community, as I said. And yeah, here we're trying to support as many students as possible. Uh, now, in terms of support, as you've heard, uh, there's about 170,000 users, which leads to a lot of questions and issues, obviously as its uh, historical material was not designed as uh, yes, contemporary uh, papers, uh, you really have a huge variety of materials and a huge variety of questions and problems that come up and uh, everybody has a different approach to extracting that information and unlocking those sources. Uh, for that, uh, we try to set up a very extensive help center, uh, which you can check out on help.transcribus.org. But obviously, we're always happy to reply to your requests on, on the info at transcribus.org email address, uh, which you can obviously also find on the help center. And yeah, please check it out if you have any questions. Very often, that's the quickest uh, way where you can uh, answer questions. But obviously, if the help center doesn't help out, uh, you can always consult our uh, support team, which I think does a really great job in providing uh, that support to basically everyone. And now uh, a little outlook, uh, as you might have seen already, or maybe not seen, and, and I'm telling you in this very moment, we're having a user conference in about a month. So on the 15th and 16th of February, we will have a hybrid conference in Innsbruck and online. 
with the title of the, the future of information extraction. So uh, here we will focus mainly on uh, extracting information from historical sources. We have more than 60 speakers confirmed. Uh, and as you can see on the photo of the last time, so about a third of the uh, attendees of that conference, it will be between 150 and 200 attendees. So it's not an extensive uh, uh, conference, at least in person participations, as obviously also COVID, COVID has shown us, uh, we don't always need to travel far uh, to enjoy such events. And that's why we also try to make it hybrid. So online, there's obviously a lot more of participation as you can join from everywhere. Uh, but still, with uh, more than 60 people being on the stage and presenting their work, uh, yeah, we have at least a feeling that this conference gives the opportunity to so many exciting projects again to show what everybody's up to and yeah, sharing their experiences with transcribers and maybe in also inspire, inspiring others on yeah, how problems could be solved and how uh, historical sources can be unlocked to come back to our vision. And if you're interested in what's on the agenda for this year in terms of new features, uh, yeah, I would encourage you to take part in the user conference. So there's a lot of exciting things, as you've heard before. Uh, maybe I've read it in the chat. I'm not entirely sure. Um, we are working on named entity recognition. So uh, that is another uh, AI-based approach to extract information. So tagging uh, text, so basically entities in the text, will be a new addition to the models that you can train in Transcribus that will be available on beta soon. But we're also yeah on other journeys, such as large language models, as with the introduction of ChatGPT, it's uh, yeah in all of our minds and smartphones and uh, work. So many of us have experienced what large language models are capable of, and combining this with Transcribus is obviously uh, something very exciting. We are very cautious, of course. We don't want to introduce large language models just through uh, yeah integrating it with some uh, existing service providers. So we are working on them on our own at the moment and really trying to as with that approach or had that approach uh, since the beginning, we try to have everything that is computed on our own servers and our own premises. So we try to make that available uh, only through our infrastructure. And for that, we need to work a lot. It's hard work, but also very exciting work. And we're very yeah, happy, hopefully, then to present something in the upcoming months. And obviously, we're also continuing the work on the web app. We will work on a new desktop app. Many of you might know uh, the old desktop app. We're already working on that. So that's also something that is on the agenda. And those exciting things, we will yeah. talk in more details about those things during the user conference, especially the first morning on the Thursday of the 15th. Um, you might tune in. And even better, if you're here in person in Innsbruck, uh, then come by, have a chat with us, and yeah, experience what we're up to. That having said, it's time for questions. We're pretty sharp in time, so I'm not sure. Maybe uh, someone that is or was reviewing the chat has some open questions that we could discuss now, uh, if there are some. I've seen that many questions were answered directly in the chat, which is really great. But if there are any questions, maybe uh, we can now talk about them. Maybe, Sarah or Miriam, do you have anything on top of your lists that we should address. Yes, um, I noted down one question, which was about uh, tags and how they can get exported to use them within other, um, yeah, outside of Transcribus. Yeah. So if we can so, talk a bit more about exporting yeah, so tags. Let's maybe jump back to the software. So tags is a very exciting thing, as we as I've uh, also just briefly mentioned with named entity recognition. Uh, I'm not sure in which document we have some tags. Let me quickly jump into some. Otherwise, we just create some. Uh, here, we don't even have, have text, so that's a bad example. Uh, but we have in the example letter. <laughs> so tagging, let's move that a little bit to the side. Basically, it's a very nice uh, approach to enriching your material. So obviously, uh, if you talk about Boston, Obviously, we all know there's a big city in the US that is called Boston, but there might be some other places that are called Boston, and you want to tag that in a certain way. You want to say, 
Um, yeah, that's a certain, yeah, that's maybe place is not enabled. Here you can enable tags, by the way. Um, once that is enabled, you can also tag Boston as such. And then reach it with more metadata. For instance, if you click on Wikidata ID, it already provides you this uh, entry in the Wikidata um, database, and you can connect it with that. So like that, you can enrich your material with metadata. And the underlying format within Transcribos currently is XML. So there's different versions of XML and different um, standards of XML. But basically, you can export that text as an XML, and basically that's a yeah, very common format which you can use then in yeah, any other app or transform it to other formats. You can uh, export it. Let's now quickly save it. Just an example. Once you select that page or the entire document, you can go to export and then select what you want to export. As said, you can export a standard document where you can select what you want to uh, export. There's, yeah. There are different XML formats such as page, which is basically the standard format with transcribers, but also Alto XML that you can export. But you can also export spreadsheets, which is available here. And we will add some more options where you can also add those tags into spreadsheets and basically export the data that you have enriched into a database or a spreadsheet, as you might have known. Does that answer the question? I hope so, unless well, there is anything still open. Just consult the chat or type it in the chat. And we're happy to answer that. Anything else we could have a look at? Maybe we could just, because it has come up in the chat, just, um, yeah, just a reminder again, or to make it clear that if you work with other people in Transcribus, you might be um, or you might need to be in a scholarship plan, but others who are just correcting text or or a layout or something like that, they don't need to be in a higher subscription plan. So they can stay in the individual plan and just use Transcribus for free. Um, exactly. One of the so common mis misconceptions, so yes, if you are in a, in a collection, for instance, you have user management here, and here you can see there's three users, and you can also yet add other users uh, that you know the email of to your collection and then provide them with access. And mainly they can do anything. They can use the editor. They can alter text. They can tag. They can uh, yeah, work on the layout, uh, basically anything you, you can imagine. What will be limited is the usage of some advanced tools such as supermodels. Yeah, now I'm the free trial, so I can use it. Uh, but if they are not on a scholar plan, they will not be able to use supermodels, so they cannot run a recognition job with that model or train field models or table models. So those advanced advanced features will be limited. But other than that, uh, that features will be available as to anyone, anybody. Yeah, there was a question regarding Gobi and Tintranda. Um, I'm not perfectly uh, up to date, but I think that's also one of the good cases where the API is being used. Um, would need to look that up. So, uh, yeah, cannot answer that right off the bat. Okay, yeah, uh, Austrian current is already answered. Um, how can I finish my subscription? I think canceling the subscription, that's also something where you can, yeah, now I'm only on the free plan, but if you click here, then you can click on manage subscription and you will end up on the, uh, yeah, user management where you can manage your subscription and yeah, cancel it. You're always sad, of course, if we see someone leaving because the major uh, motivation that we have is really to provide a tool that is of help, that can help achieve your things. If not, obviously we don't want anybody to force or force anybody to stay with us. And so you can cancel any time basically. Uh, yeah, natural yeah, language maybe... processing. Yeah, Sarah, sorry. Yeah, maybe Flo, you can better explain the, the extension between uh, 
uh, training rounds uh, and uh, credits uh, because there was a bit con a bit of confusion. Yeah. So what you can do with the individual plan? So it's quite straightforward. If you get 100 free credits every month on the individual plan, you will see your available credits here. So this account is a little bit older, so it has more. Um, but you will see your available credits here and uh, credit equals a page. So you can process, process one page per credit to recognize one page per credit with those 100 free credits. So basically you can recognize 100 free, free uh, pages free every month. While as the training runs, they are not limited yet. That's still in beta stage, but we will move that also to uh, the production. So app.transcribe soon. And then basically you can train five models so you can try in five models a month, which is, I think, uh, still a pretty large amount where you can train your own uh, AI model. And basically the amount of pages you throw into such a model is not limited. So you can train as big as a, of a model as you like. Yeah, my question on API use. There will be a webinar. We're currently in talks. So we will have a webinar on API use soon. Um, anything else? I think there was a question regarding natural language processing. That's also something we will address at the user conference. So yeah, you might tune in there, but obviously natural language processing is something very important because if there's like, um, yeah, more complex tasks where you want to dig deeper into the text then natural language processing is something very exciting. Okay, since we're all running a little bit, I would like to round it off unless there's anything else. Yeah, really happy that so many joined and so many are still here, even if we're over running a little bit and we almost, yeah, it took almost two hours now. Uh, it's really great that so many of you are passionate about what we're doing here. And we were also passionate about what you're doing with Transcribo, so we really try to listen to you and try and incorporate that. Um, yeah, thank you to everybody that was also presenting today. Did a great job, I guess. Uh, so uh, really uh, big thank you to everybody. We will have some more webinars soon. So webinars will be a little bit more. I've also read that it was not perfectly uh, aligned that we f first uh, talked about the basics. So um, this was a webinar where we tried to have it as extensively as possible. Um, but yes, uh, I would say uh, it was a nice evening or morning, wherever in the world you are, or night. Uh, if you're really very passionate about Transcribus, then it's really great if you joined us uh, during the night. If you're farther east of Europe, then it's really great to have you here. And yeah, thank you for using Transcribus. And as we always say, keep unlocking the past. And yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>